I'm going to start the meeting by reading um, the statement that I need to read and then we'll begin our meeting. As chair of the Housing Advisory Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with the governor's emergency orders, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. On May 12th, 2021, public notice of this meeting was posted on the town website and on the bulletin board of the town offices located at 10 Front Street in Exeter. As provided in that public notice, the public may access the meeting online and via telephone. Please note that all votes, well, we don't really vote, but uh, taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call. Let's, I'm gonna start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with them um, during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. So I'm gonna start Nancy Belanger, Exeter, Chair. Uh, Lindsay. Good morning, Lindsay Sonnet, and I'm in the room alone. Uh, yes, I'm in the room alone, too. Thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> Darren? Good morning, everybody. I'm in the room alone. Uh, yeah, Darren Winham, Economic Development, Exeter. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dean? Uh, good morning, all. Russ Dean, town manager. I'm in my office, and I am by myself. Mr. Cameron? Good morning, Pete Cameron, planning board representative, and my wife just left the room. Another Nancy. Good morning. Good morning, um, I'm Nancy. Go ahead, Nancy. Nancy Comer, Economic Development Director for City of Portsmouth. I'm in City Hall in my office alone. Thank you. Uh, Justin? Uh, Justin Rivlin, uh, in my room alone. Uh, work for the River House Restaurant. Welcome. And Sarah? Uh, Sarah Reitzman, Director of the Workforce Housing Coalition of the Greater Seacoast. I am in my home office alone. Good morning, everyone. I don't think I've missed everyone. If I have anyone, if I have, please state so now. Okay. Um, Darren, I'm going to let you take over the meeting and introduce our guests. Um, am I wrong in seeing that we only have, um, we only have Justin Riddle, we don't have uh, John Tenius or Laurie Chevalier yet? You are not wrong. Okay, so I'll introduce them when they come on. Hopefully they do. Um, so Justin Rivlin is the general manager uh, from the uh, River House. Uh, Nancy, of course, knows him better than I. I might want to add some stuff, Nancy, before we start. Oh, she's muted. You're muted. Um, I, this is the first time I'm meeting Justin. Um, <laughs> I, can I, was <laughs> I was introduced to him electronically from uh, Peter Labrie, who uh, is one of the family owners of River House and Atlantic Grill and the soon to be Jimmy's on Congress. Yeah, so I've uh, I've been with the River House now for about a year. I've been uh, Mike's general manager, um, helped them, you know, develop the Atlantic Grill over in Rye. Uh, not so much involved with Jimmy's just because uh, it's taken a little bit of, uh, you know, it's a little bit of an uphill uh, start going uh, into this season. So I've taken a step back, helping them with that and uh, really been focusing on more of the uh, other properties, specifically the River House at the moment. So, Justin, I think what we want to do, if we can, is try to get a sense of uh, the, you know, the workforce housing issue uh, epidemic on the seacoast, how that's affected your business. And then, Nancy, if you don't mind afterwards, since our other guests aren't here yet, you, you can speak for a lot of businesses at Portsmouth. So that would be very helpful for this uh, audience to hear. Sure. Uh, so. Good morning, Lovey. Yeah. In regards to, you know, workforce housing, I mean, and Nancy definitely can probably give you some statistics on it, but I would say that uh, there's a massive portion of people, if not the majority of our restaurant that do not work, uh, or sorry, do not live in the city of Portsmouth. Uh, you'll see them coming in from outside communities. Um, and, you know, this, including myself, which I don't live in Portsmouth, I actually live in Stratum. Um, I think that the word around, you know, at least the city of Portsmouth is that, you know, you could spend a small fortune and live in the city, but uh, the easier option is to find 
something outside. So um, I would say that, uh, you know, there's definitely a difficulty that uh, in that regard. Uh, and we're also looking at, you know, hiring kids, you know, that are 15 to 16 years old now still commuting into the city of Portsmouth from outside neighboring towns, uh, making anywhere from 13 to $15 an hour. So um, it's uh, definitely a struggle in the hiring uh, regard. Uh, parking is always an issue in the city. Um, so I don't know if that <laughs> steers the conversation in the right direction, but Nancy you probably could fill in the gap there. Uh, would, would you like me to speak a little bit to the issue? Chairman, Chairwoman, do you want me to speak? Um, yes, I think, please. Justin, you uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I know that at a, at, at a site walk that I recently attended, Peter said that they, I believe they had 22 positions open, it might have been just at the Atlantic Grill, or I don't know if it was at all, all of the properties. Can you speak to the number of openings that you have at Riverhouse? Yeah, so I would say that that number is definitely modest. Uh, and that was a, probably a week ago that he told you. I would say that we're probably looking at about another 30 uh, employees to be hired um, in the next, well, should have been in the last couple of uh, weeks. Um, now we're in the middle of it. And, uh, you know, that is everything from line cooks to... Um, food runners to servers to bartenders. It's not just a particular position. It's, it's across the board. So uh, it's definitely made it an uphill battle for sure. So I, I can speak a little bit to it, but I, I kind of want to preference it to, I don't know if anybody attended the, um, the BIA webinar yesterday where the Bank of Boston economist uh, presented, but um, I'll share that slide deck with Darren and he can maybe share it with you because it's it had some really interesting information. Um, same for you, Sarah. And I know Sarah knows all the numbers about median home prices and, and things like that in the seacoast. But, you know, it, it's not a secret that, um, you know, Portsmouth is a desirable place to live. Um, we're, we don't have a lot of land left to to develop. Um, you know, our median home price right now, and, you know, this is for the smallest units is that for, for, for purchasing is about $450,000. Does that sound right, Sarah? Um, uh, so, so, you know, I, I don't live in, Port I don't live in Portsmouth either. Um, it's, it's, it's out of reach for, for a lot of people. Um, and I just want to you know, just go back. We, we did, we did a survey for uh, a business retention and expansion survey, um, and you, Darren may have done it for Exeter, but um, one of one of the factors that uh, companies were most concerned about w was uh, attracting talent. And it's it's across the board. It's skilled and unskilled. And uh, part of that was uh, the ability to find homes and even even our hospital and trying to find nurses and, and physicians. Um, so it, it it crosses all sectors of um of the wealth income, if you will, um, but at this uh, at this webinar yesterday, the economist was talking about how New Hampshire has recovered, and as most of you probably know, last April our our unemployment rate. I can speak to Portsmouth that I think it was pretty much the same statewide it was between 16 and 17 percent i've been for i've been at the city for 20 years i've never seen it like that i was frightened i was very frightened when when those numbers started coming in um it, remarkably we have recovered we are now at about 2.9 percent which is pretty much full employment so it makes it even more difficult for um for our employers who have who had to downsize because of the pandemic. Um, and to Justin's point, many people don't live in Portsmouth that work in our hospitality industry. And just the numbers on hospitality is um, the state lost 57% of its hospitality workforce during the pandemic. It's back now at 81%. So we're almost recovered, but I think the, the last mile is gonna be very, very difficult. And in the Seacoast, we're disproportionately affected by hospitality 
um, employment because we're a destination location. So I think um, going forward, this is going to going to impede our growth, uh, on, not just in hospitality and in all of the sectors in, in that slide deck that I'll share with uh, Darren, y- you can see that. Um, and, you know, sadly, the, the, the corollary is that most of the jobs that were lost were at the pay grade that were at the lowest. Uh, so it's going to be hard to climb back. Um, I can just tell you that businesses that I, that I talk to are concerned ab- about, about finding employment. M- many of them don't t- say why. They're just talking whether it's about skills gap. But we do know that, the, but that housing I- is a concern. Just I can speak to the city as well. We have um, we've had a, a position for an electrician open for two years, and you and you might think, well, that's there's an easy solution. You just raise the the pay grade for that and 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 get on par with compensation elsewhere. Of course, we're constrained by collective bargaining, so we we're struggling there. We're struggling with mechanics. We're struggling with wastewater treatment. Folks, we're struggling to find people that will just um, monitor our, our our parking program. The, the folks that give us those lovely tickets when we are not there the second we're, you know, our, our meter expires. So um, it, it's it's really difficult at the city level, and I, and we're we're competing Portsmouth and I probably Exeter too for some of these the skilled laborers with the shipyard and the sh- the shipyard pays higher wages, they have excellent benefits, and they're aggressively hiring, and they're, they're, um, they're recruiting with bonuses. So the competition for, for workers is very difficult, and then throw in the housing piece, um, and, it, and it really exacerbates this, the situation. Um, you know, some folks say that one thing that's impeding this is the, the $300 a week bump that uh, is a result of the, the CARES in the American Rescue Plan, which is due to expire. It's either September or December. Um, but it's interesting, the perspective, when you talk to different folks, when I talked to our welfare officer, she said, you know, a lot of people are staying home be- that are making this $300 additional income because for the first time in their lives, they're making a, a, a livable wage due to it. So, it's a conundrum that that we're that we're you know trying to sort out. I don't know if there's many easy answers. Um, during our budget meeting last night, our planning director uh, told our council that we currently have another 1,200 residential units being built as we speak in construction projects that are in the pipeline, um, and another I think it's 287 hotel rooms. Um, I don't know where we're going to, we're going to get the, the workforce, you know, f- to fill some of those positions. So um, that's kind of the landscape that I can that I can relate here. I uh, just add on to that too, um, and it, I guess it's another piece to at least the hospitality puzzle, and that is the uh, the J one uh, the work visa is another huge component of what we as uh, in the hospitality group have relied on uh, is these exchange students coming over. It seems like uh, this time of year, uh, there's a massive influx of uh, students from all over the world coming in. Um, uh, We personally sponsor three, uh, three students that have worked for us that can find housing on their own because they've been to this area before. Uh, other than that, uh, normally the hotels, I believe, will get dozens. And I'm not sure where they find housing for them, but I'm not quite sure if they're going to be getting them this year just because the uh, I know a lot of them have had major, major issues with finding that um, visa stat, that J-1 visa status has just been so difficult to get. Um, And, uh, you know, you're talking hundreds of kids that not only work in the hotels, but the restaurants and other industries as well. Yes, um, Darren knows this as well, that, you know, our our state senators are working uh, on trying to alleviate that roadblock. But a lot of the countries that these J-1 students come from, um, it seems to be Eastern Bloc, you know, Western European company, countries like Romania, um, they're still um, banned 
for pandemic reasons from coming in into the U.S. So it's going to uh, put a strain. Definitely, it's going to further exacerbate it. I know that um, you know on, on on the upside there we do have some some um, hospitality entrepreneurs here in Portsmouth who have just gone out and purchased multi-family dwellings for some of their workforce to live in. But um, at the at the price points that that are out there right now, it it becomes increasingly difficult to do that. What what type of businesses, Nancy, are doing that? Um, I know J- uh, Jay McSherry from Jumpin' Jays has done that. And um, I know that uh, uh, the Gaslight, Paul, Paul Sorley, um, provided some some housing for some of his J1 students. Um, and, and and I can see when I come into work from Kittery, I, I oftentimes see some of these workers riding their bikes across the bridge. You know, the, the city's... Um, the city has helped find them transportation, you know, through through bikes, so that they can get around town. And we've also offered um, uh, complimentary uh, passes to our recreation center. That that kind of thing, those kind of perks. So the project Tom Monahan is planning on doing across from Mobile on the Run in Exeter, there's four companies in Exeter that are trying to get uh, some of those units for their workers. You know, yes, six and we've talked. Is- Sorry. No, go ahead. No, it, it, it was interesting because you were talking about hospitality at that point, but I'm, I'm seeing manufacturers that are trying to find, you know, housing for their employees. A lot of people moving out of the cities trying to buy homes. It's a, it's a bidding war right now and right. it's just getting worse and worse. And so uh, all these companies that really, really need workers, not just the hospitality, they're having tremendous trouble. You, you mentioned that you guys have electrician. We have an uh, electrical uh, inspector job. We've had open forever. Can't land, DPW can't land people there either. We're not as competitive, even though we're offering all kinds of benefits and what have you. We also looked into, I say we, um, I want to give all credit to the uh, folks that run our hospitality um, industry here, but worked with you, tried to get work with UNH to say, well, could we billet these these students, these foreign students at UNH and, and arrange transportation to and from? But the unfortunate thing about that is the timing of these J1s, and correct me if I'm wrong, Justin, is that the, the way that program is supposed to work is to give them this, this opportunity to work in the field of hospitality, but also then at the end of their stay, allow them to do, stay on and do some traveling and see this, the part of the world that, that they're working in. So they typically stay into October. So that time frame doesn't really work with uh, with. The, the dorms at, at UNH. Yeah, I think um, this year, the three that we're getting, two of them, their visa got pushed back to July, which would make them staying till the end of October. One of them, I think, is coming early June, but yeah, we'll be here till the end of October. As far as traveling, as, as a sponsor, we're really uh, focused on giving them you know, more of an arts and entertainment side of things. Some of them travel, some of them work 80 hours a week until they can go back to their country. It's dependent on the student, but uh, some form of uh, culture uh, is provided one way or another. Um, Okay, so Justin, can I ask you a question? What strategies are you using right now for hiring? For Um, Well, uh, you know, it's funny. uh, I don't really watch the reality shows, but I felt like uh, this last bartender, I felt like I was selling her, you know, this dream job and like, look at the water and look at the, uh, you know, look at the friendly atmosphere that we have here. And it's like, please choose us. And she was had a stack full of resumes and she was like, oh, stop. And I was like, no, please, no. Don't go any further. I have a recycling bin. Toss them. You know, you don't need to go uh, down the street. But in all reality, I mean, some of these like more skilled positions like line cooks and bartenders literally have the run of the mill. I mean, not only can they choose, which is okay. I mean, that's that's good. You should pick a place that you want to work. But, um, you know, it's... The money is a driving factor, Um, you know, uh, obviously with the line cooks, that's a little bit focused on the hourly as opposed to like how busy we are as a a tips restaurant. Um, 
you know, we're in the process of hiring for a manager as well. And that's uh, an uphill battle. Um, ironically, I and foolishly posted that management position on one of the Facebook sites, uh, the groups like unofficial city of Portsmouth. Uh, if you're on the Exeter, uh, <laughs> um, Exeter talks, sometimes I'll post on that. Um, maybe not supposed to, but you know, whatever, whatever counts, but, uh, man, people will even tear that apart. I made that foolish decision to, you know, do that. But, uh, in all reality, there's not much a restaurant can do other than paint a good picture that, um, you know, we're a good spot. Uh, unfortunately this season more than ever, we've had this incredible number of people that will either apply and not respond to a phone call or an email, or they will uh, set up an interview and they will not show up. Um, and I honestly, I know that we were talking about that, um, that extra $300, but this is, I think a great example. And uh, what I think is proof that people really are kind of hugging on to that idea that unemployment is um, a better option than going back into the workforce. Um, I had a woman the other day that applied for a bartending position, set up an interview, didn't show up. I called her to give her the benefit of the doubt, and she answers and says, oh, yeah, where are you guys located again? Um, I thought that was funny that she hadn't even, uh, you know, done the homework to see where we were, then hung up the phone. So, hmm. you know, there's a big, there's, and it's not an exaggeration. By any means, I mean, we're talking um, in the course of a week, probably about 15 people that will apply and then not respond to, um, you know, a phone call or, or uh, an email. We're probably talking about four people that will set up an interview and not show up about we're, per week. Yeah, we're hearing that from a lot of employers, not just hospitality, because now you're required to show that you're looking for a job um, at the state level. That's the one thing that they did. Um, because of pushback from a lot of the industry and the economic development practitioners, it's like it can't, it shouldn't just be that easy to wait for the mail and get your check. And um, so they instituted this. You have to show, you have to show evidence that you've looked for a job. So the people are setting up these interviews and not showing up. It happened to another employer in Portsmouth 20 times within the last two weeks. That's happening in Exeter as well. Um, two states, uh, Wyoming, I think, like South Carolina said, they just did away with allowing their residents to get the federal uh, unemployment. They just stopped it for exactly that reason. Um, so apologies that two of our guests didn't show up. I was very much looking forward to FOSS Manufacturing because I want to hear what they had to say. I know they have 30 openings they need to fill immediately. I want to hear what they were trying to do to fill them. So I don't know why uh, FOSS and uh, John Tenius didn't make it. It's a shame. But while we have Nancy, I thought – this is my thought is so Nancy, what we're trying to do, this group is trying to do is to show the crisis of workforce housing and then do basically a, I'm not going to say roadshow, but to try to convince these other communities, your Northamptons, your Stratums, Kensington, et cetera, that they need to accept um, uh, infrastructure that would allow them to have multifamily housing so that our workforce uh you know, we could find the workforce that these companies need because we've had threats of good companies leaving and moving south because they cannot find workers and they don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. And so what I wanted to ask you, uh, if it's okay with the other Nancy, is how do you think this group can go about either trying to change either legislation or convincing some of these towns that they really need to work with all of us the things, the Exeters, the Hamptons, the Portsmouths, encouraging it. It's a, this is a really difficult situation. I know Sarah, Sarah can speak to it. Um, you know, one of the things, and, and my bias is that, you know, coming from the, the public sector, from a municipality is oftentimes the complaint it, it, it is that zoning is too difficult. The reason we're not doing this is because of zoning. And I, I feel like that's a little unfair. There's probably truth, some truth to that. But in Portsmouth, you know, we allow density bonuses. We know we've incorporated modifications into our our, our zoning to, to incent people. 
the, the problem is right now, it's just so difficult because the cost of land is so high and the cost mm. for new construction, at least, the cost of materials, just look at wood alone, is so extraordinarily high right now that any, any developer is going to do what they do is just try to make the best profit. So they're going to go, they're going to not go for those incentives or, or the menu of, you know, tax credits and the types of things that you need to do, you know, to really be effective in getting multifamily um, housing constructed in, in your community. Um, you know, I, you know, I think maybe a harder push for assistance on that, but at the end of the day, I really feel like we need legislation that requires a, a flat percentage, like Massachusetts does, a flat percentage. If you're building residential, 20% of the units have to be, you know, within the, call it the workforce housing or the affordable housing definition, income definition. But I don't think we're going to move the bar much unless we have a mandate like that. And, and the best thing to do is probably just show the testimonials. To me, it's, it's, this is about growth and creating wealth in our community. And we're going to be at a standstill until um, we are not going to be able to grow. We, we just can't if you don't have the workforce to do it across the spectrum, skilled, unskilled, whatever it is. So what, about think, convincing, you know, what about convincing a town? I'm sorry? Say that. that. That, that is a true what you said about uh, convincing them. Um, what about convincing the Northamptons? How about how do, how do we convince them? So uh, legislation would certainly have uh, developers willing to do it, but then if they don't change the zoning, if they don't do something um, to you broke, you're breaking up a little bit. Allow this to see the, the crisis for what it is. Oh, sorry about that. I'm in a hotel in Boston. It's not coming too good. Oh. Um, what I was wondering is how how do we convince other towns? I just think you have to, we have to educate them of like the, the, the growth perspective going forward. That it's, you know, if you, you want to succeed, but you know, there's numbers and Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we have a lot of economists that have worked on this and um, we can, we can demonstrate that. I think what's, what's a little dicey about it is one or two towns trying to dictate to another because of the way New Hampshire's governments are set up and we're so colloquial. Um, I, I want to, I'd, I'd like to think about that more, but I, I, you know, I think it's a, an interesting strategy to, you know, to try to get other people on board to either, you know, lobby for some kind of legislation that, that, that will, it, enhance the situation for for creating more housing other than just saying you know you got to change you got to change your zoning <laughs> so i know you said you had a nine o'clock nancy i don't know how flexible that is and so nancy b i don't know where we go from here um direction <laughs> no this is great um so i want to ask one more question of russ russ are you are you there what's exeter's unemployment at the moment uh, right now, we've actually, like Nancy was saying, we've bounced back. So we're at 3.1%. Thank you. As of the last data point. So we're we're doing really well. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, I want to thank Nancy and Justin for, for attending. It's been, um, it's very much appreciated. Um, I hope you'll, you'll be available in the future for our next steps. Our idea is... As Nancy made a great point, not to dictate to another community how to do this, but be part of a conversation that hopefully we can find some answers together. Um, and that's our, our goal right now for the Housing Advisory Committee in Exeter, um, not just for our community, but our area communities as well. So um, thank you both for attending. Oh, Nancy, did you want to say I just something? Wanted to, I wanted to thank, thank you for inviting uh, Justin and I, and um, and offer that we would stay engaged um, as part of you know uh, trying to find a solution to this. And I, you know, I certain I could get Juliet Walker, our planning director, to talk a little bit about so what some of our zoning incentives are and whether they've been successful or not. It's it's tough, 
Um, and then one last point, I would really like to thank Darren for all the work that he has done um, with our regional Seacoast Economic Development folks. He's taken a leadership role and he's been re- a great resource as we move through toward recovery from the pandemic. So um, thanks to Darren and thanks to Bob as well um, for, for their help and communication. Thank you, Nancy. That's sweet. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, leader, uh, so. <laughs> one of our next one of our hopefully very near future goals is to have a regional meeting. Um, so once we can pull that together, the invites will go out to everybody who is already participating. And hopefully we can get more people. The more, the better. Um, it's going to take some brainstorming. Um, and our town planner will be available, too. He's on vacation um, and so isn't Darren today, by the way. He finally got a night out with the guys to go to a Red Sox game. And, and they crushed it, it anyway. The crushed um, it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you, Darren, for, for taking some time this morning on your day off. Appreciate it. No, I'm, I feel I'm just sad that uh, Foss and uh, John Tineos couldn't make it. I, I don't know why. I'm sure they had something that was pressing, but uh, Right. Um, I'll at least I'll get some testimonials from them anyway, because I especially want to hear from FOSS because they are completely desperate. Other companies like them are desperate. And I want to tr- try to figure out and articulate um, not just how bad it is, but what they're trying to do. What, what type of unique methods are they trying to hire? Because whatever they're doing, unfortunately, really isn't working because nobody can find housing. Right. Yes. So. So thank you. Um, thank you for attending this morning. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Have a good day, Darren. Um, So, Lovey, you're here. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yep, I'm here. Um, Got family around, so just be on mute, but listening thus far. Thank you. And you've been here for a while. It was just my first chance to. No, no, that's fine. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's uh, let me get my view changed here. So, we are moving along, aren't we? Anyone have any thoughts on the conversation we just had? Just a quick point. I just wanted to point out that one of the things we've been doing recently is working with the Great Bay communities on on an intermunicipal agreement that is uh, in a format that Sarah, maybe you want to take a look at in terms of what its use might be for housing. Um, Mm. It's definitely a a step forward. It's the municipal uh, adaptation management team and Rochester, Portsmouth and Dover were the three communities that spearheaded it originally, but many communities around the Great Bay were involved and can sign on at their, uh, you know, at their willingness to sign on at the community level. And when they do that, and basically it's just to take strategies uh, relative to Great Bay and nitrogen loading and try to address those as a group, as a coalition. And uh, I think it's a, a form that might have some application to housing. If there are a few champions in the area that would be willing to do the same thing, all it would take are three or four communities to kind of gather around that idea. And then we could, we, we could make it work by adding communities at their convenience. So I don't know if there's anything like that Sarah, on your end, but I just wanted to bring that up as it's something new that we're, we're embarking on. It seems to be going very well so far. That's like a really interesting idea. Nothing I'm familiar with with um, housing, but certainly we could use the inspiration since the regional collaboration part is not something that we figured out. Yeah, I'm happy to share that on, on an email with you. Russ, could you send that link? Because, you know, me trying to take meeting minutes and and getting everything down is not always the easiest. So if you could send me a link to that, that would be great. I will do that. Nancy, I want to make sure we recognize our guests, too. Uh, Well, I'm trying. I was listening to to Russ and Sarah and noticing that someone has joined us under Darren. And I imagine it's probably one of our. Okay, so this is John Tinius from uh, Hampton, Galliach. How you doing? Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, I'm sorry I'm late, but uh, I got held up in a meeting earlier. so. And that's what we figured. Um, and Darren is in Boston this morning, so he's already gone for the day. He, he had the day off and joined us for that part of the meeting. Um, 
I mean, if uh, I can ask you some questions, yeah. if you, um, you know, so the idea is, is just trying to get an understanding of our local and regional businesses, the difficulties they're, they're having with hiring and, and your vacancies and, you know, how many and things like that. I lost you there for a second. Oh, there you are. You back? I'm back now. Okay. How much did you? How much did you hear? I, I guess. Um, I, I just missed. I just missed that entire whatever you just said. Yes. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to have you do, if you wouldn't mind, is introduce yourself and 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 um, tell us the businesses that you have, you own, um, and what difficulties you're having with recruitment, um, you know, um, your, your, how many vac jobs you're trying to fill, things like that. Okay, sure. Thank so, you. Okay, John Tinius, I own the Galley Hatch in Hampton, as well as Tino's uh, upstairs Mediterranean uh, restaurant. Uh, I own Popovers in Epping and Popovers in Portsmouth and Grill 28 at Pease. Altogether, when we're at full employment, we have 325 to 30 employees, 10% short of uh, fulfilling our needs. And, uh, you know, we've hired some people that we normally probably wouldn't hire, like we don't hire 15-year-olds. We've hired 15-year-olds this year just to do some, you know, busing and prep and, you know, you name it. Uh, it's been a it's been an interesting year for sure and if you're not thinking we've done that um that uh that the biggest uh thing that uh down the thir 300 extra dollars uh that the federal um also i would say that Am I still on? You are. Okay, great. Because it looked like I went I went out for a second. Um, as far as you know, as far as the chambers go in this area, I would love to see more of a link between uh, all of us: uh, Exeter, Hampton, Portsmouth, uh, Northampton, Seabrook, uh, so that we're all on the same page. Because I think we have all have similar issues right now. Uh, getting through the pandemic has been tough on a lot of small businesses. Uh, we've lost a bunch. Uh, I know that some new ones are, uh, are joining us at this point. Um, but, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done before uh, we actually get back to normal. Uh, and I think the way that we can uh, do that is to link ourselves with transportation, uh, with, um, you know, maybe even – putting together our own uh, recruitment uh, for uh, small business employees in the area as a, you know, as a joint effort of uh, the chambers around here. Um, but I think that, you know, I think that together we're stronger and uh, we should utilize our strengths and uh, help the small business guy in this community, which is a lot of us. Do you feel that housing or lack of affordable housing is is one of the issues with your, you know, trying to fill your absolutely. vacancies? Ab absolutely, and I think I think you know we have to lobby our you know local government. This is really you know a, a crisis right now that our employees can't afford to live around here. that it can wait and that is the purpose of our having these meetings and and trying to take them and and, and invite so we started with just exeter businesses and we're expanding to our regional businesses and and going from there all right so one of our and this meeting hasn't finished yet so one of the next things we're, we're going to talk about is actually inviting chamber of commerces to a next meeting I think that's a great idea. Yeah. And and then we're, we're looking to have a regional meeting um, very soon. 
um, and invite as many people who are willing to come and have conversations and try to brainstorm. And the idea is to ultimately get to the level of Concord um, and, and try to have a conversation to um, brainstorm for some solutions. Yeah, I think we need our own small business revitalization, uh, you know, effort in the state. Yeah, so great. So I hope that you can um, continue to attend our meetings and Darren will keep you up to date, um, especially for the next one. If, if we can manage to get our local um, Chamber of Commerce presidents to attend and have a conversation that includes them. Well, I think that I, I think that everybody's I think that everybody's willing. We just need we need, uh, you know, we need somebody to start the ball. Rolling. And that's what we're, we're hoping to do with, with this group. I applaud your I applaud your effort and uh, I will be there for you if, uh, you know, you get just uh, keep me in the loop. Thank you, sir. Thank you for attending. No problem. OK, have a good day. My pleasure. You too. Thanks. Okay, everyone. So we're back. So thankful. Thank that was good. Sorry to interrupt the, the flow there, but it was I think important, and I'm sure you all agree that to, to uh, have him talk with us. Just so, the back to the rest of the idea. I like that though. I mean, anything that lends itself to regional cooperation on this. Yes. So so. Uh, Russ, I'm sorry that kind of threw threw me off a little bit with what you were talking about earlier. Um, it, is this a group that you think would? So Darren and I were talking, and then we pulled Sarah in for some thoughts um, a, a few days ago um, about Chamber of Commerce, our local Chamber of Commerce, so the Exeter area, Hampton, etc., um, to expand the conversation. A little bit and and for small businesses um so russ do you think this this group that you were talking about is somebody that we should include in that group um it it could be the uh <coughs> excuse me the ima group is mainly communities around the great bay watershed so it's really driven by municipal uh municipalities based upon their wastewater permits and the NIFTES process that each community has been going through. Okay. So, um, I think it might start with community involvement of the major players like Adova or Portsmouth or Rochester and Exeter to kind of get into a coalition of the willing, if you will, to, to look at this issue on a legislative level. So, and I think we could bring in other players as we go, but definitely I see a need to have the business community actively engaged in it as well. I think that that's really a, a really important relationship that needs to be forged and um, and fostered and made better so that they're, they are <clears throat> some of our key champions when we're bringing up these issues. Okay. So I want to um, follow up on that. And do you think that this group that you're talking about is would be our next step and then the Chamber of Commerce or... I'd kind of like to have a game plan for our next invites. Yeah, I, I think this group could be it. I'd like to hear from Sarah a little bit in terms of the legislative aspects of what's going on and sort of get a feeling from her, maybe from some of the other communities that she has been in and around and worked with to see maybe to gauge their willingness to participate in a group like this. She does more work regionally than I have on this particular issue. So I, I definitely like to hear from her on it. Uh, I think the difficulty, so the struggle for us has always been that the communities who are willing to participate are willing to participate. And, um, you know, the Exeters and the Dovers and, and Portsmouth and even Rochester, you know, these are communities that we've had no problem sort of getting, getting to the table and talking with about these topics. I think that the challenge is getting the other communities to engage the ones who we have had difficulty engaging. Even when we had our 
uh, regional meeting with this group, of, I, I want to say a couple of years ago now. Um, At least. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and part of the challenge is that for a lot of these communities, they don't have full-time staff. And so that's fair. It's hard to get that sort of municipal engagement um, when they don't have a dedicated staff to their, say, like planning department. But it's been a challenge to engage the communities that have been challenging to engage. And I think that that's sort of going to continue that pattern. So figuring out a way to bring them to the table would be incredible, but I might be asking for too much. Um, I don't think so, Sarah. I, you know, my th I've been giving that some thought and it was hard to get people to come to the table. And it was probably four years ago, um, three or four. It's been a while. I know yeah. the last year has thrown us off on our, on our, ability to know those things but you know my my thought on that is it's possible that because the problem is getting worse and we rely on our businesses and if our businesses can't succeed because they can't hire people that might get more people to the table now yeah so yeah certainly to some extent i've heard a a sort of sentiment that it's not our problem you know like uh i won't name names but like a community near portsmouth might say you know it's not our responsibility to house portsmouth's workforce like they don't benefit from it so housing is regional the economy is regional but the solutions the local zoning isn't regional and that's a little bit of like a frustrating disconnect um Which and we're to hoping to bridge that right that's the idea yes please <laughs> um uh, to the, the question about legislative stuff, it's been a frustrating legislative session. A lot of the the um, bills that showed promise are no longer around. A lot of them were tabled. Um, there's a couple bills that are still sort of left standing that show some promise. That's HB 154 has to do with um, tax increment or 79E, make some changes to, uh, to how developers can take advantage of those things. Um, and... Uh, the other one that's on my radar is SB 86, which would reinstate the housing and conservation planning program, which would help communities re reach both their sort of housing goals and conservation goals in parallel. Yeah. So Julie Gilman, who is our one of our select board members and also one of our state representatives in Exeter, did send an email that I forwarded to everyone. Um, I believe there is a hearing in her committee on that on Monday, though I don't have a time. Oh, right. That's, hoping, yeah, that's SB 86. Yes. And I was hoping she was going to be able to come talk to us about that, but she wasn't available. So, um, okay. So we have to make a decision on our next invite. Some thoughts from people? I can see Lindsay. Well, the chamber route is the idea just to get more buy in. I'm just sort of thinking through. So the idea behind the Chamber of Commerce came started with um, the, the, the Chamber of Commerce president in Portsmouth, I'm sorry, in Hampton is also the de facto economic development director. He, he's been kind of filling both roles. Mm -hmm. um, so so Darren and I had a conversation about it. And, you know, the economic development directors also see things that that we don't see. Um, so we were, we were kind of brainstorming about that and, and trying to get um, Chamber of Commerce in on the conversation because they represent a lot of our small businesses and to see what avenue that could lead to. Um, so that's where we were going with that. Good. And nothing, like, nothing gained. Absolutely. You know, we're, we're trying to section our, our meetings so that we, we're not, we don't have too many people, but we're, too, you know, we, as you guys all know, we started with two different sections of our town businesses, right? We wanted to make sure we had hospitality and others. Um, so it's, it's, we're still in that, that area of who do we invite next to start bringing to the table? So when we have our regional meeting, we have a lot of a lot of people with um, a lot of people who are willing to continue to attend and have this conversation. There's certainly value in that. I wonder at what stage we're going to feel ready to take our show on the road. 
I'm not going to jump to that yet because I, we, like Darren and I two days ago thought, yeah, this might be worth another meeting. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to, I mean, please everybody else weigh in on this, but I don't want to put us a pigeonhole us into a date. Um, I'm hoping by the fall or maybe even August, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have one meeting a month. Do we want to add a meeting? I, I don't know. It's, it's not just me making these decisions. It's just me trying to input some thoughts and ideas. Mm-hmm. In terms of commerce, we can definitely reach out to Jen Wheeler at the Exeter Area Chamber. Oh, absolutely. If that's somebody you'd like to have at a meeting, I can ask her to, to come to a meeting. And Yes, we, we would not be doing those without our local Chamber of Commerce person, <laughs> President. Um, so, Chamber of Commerce, Economic Development Directors, and maybe some town planners for our next meeting. See what Darren can do with that. Let's do it. I um, have a phone call with uh, Margaret Joyce at the uh, the Dover Chamber of Commerce today. Do you want me to invite her while I have her on the phone? Yeah. If you, if you could do like an initial heads up, I'm trying to keep Darren as the contact person for invites. Um, so yes, anybody that, you know, Russ, definitely reach out to Jen. Um, and then I'll have Darren do the the final with the questions um, and things. So because of the contacts, right? We have to have their contacts. We have to give it to Bob. And, and it's just, it gets a bit much for me to, to try to keep in touch with everyone for different people. Here. <laughs> to have that's, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Nancy? Yes, sir. I think did you get my email earlier this morning? I've got to I've got another session that I've got to go to at nine thirty here. I'm sorry, I, I haven't had a chance to check my emails, so no. Um right. okay. Is it nine thirty? Well it's about nine twenty nine twenty two or so. Okay. I've got to, I've no. got to drop I got to drop out of the meeting. Thank you. All right. Well we'll All see right. you. We'll wait on the mini- meeting minutes until next meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. It's good to see you. Thank you, everybody. See you, Pete. Good to see you. Bye bye. Okay, so I'm going to add Dover to my list of people that Darren and I talked about. So that's great. All right, anybody have anything else this morning? Okay. So our next meeting is June 11th. Lovely. Lovely. So everyone feeling pretty good about where we're heading right now with, with these meetings? Yeah. And if you can think, if there's anyone that comes to mind that you think we should add to the next invite list, just email me um, and we'll go from there. Okay. Perfect. All right. And Russ, I'll be in touch because I need to schedule a meeting with you at some point just to catch up. And we were talk- talking about adding something to the Housing Advisory Committee website uh, page um, with an explanation of what it is and things. And Sarah had given me some some points on that. So, okay. okay. I'll be in touch. Okay. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks See you on June 11th. See you. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye. Thank you.